Hi everyone, this lesson is on an often unrecognized and unknown infection called echinococcosis. So echinococcosis is a zoonotic infection, meaning it comes from animals, caused by echinococcus species. Now echinococcus are cestodes or tapeworms. Now some of the problems by getting infected with this particular tapeworm isn't like other tapeworm infections, where a tapeworm would reside in the gastrointestinal system. They actually can migrate and form cysts in different parts of the body, including the liver and the lungs as well, depending on the species. So the different species include echinococcus granulosis, which causes what we would call hydatidosis or hydatid disease. We also have echinococcus multilocularis. This causes alveolar echinococcosis. There's also echinococcus vogeli, which causes polycystic echinococcosis. So each of these are different types of echinococcosis, but the one we're going to focus mostly on in this lesson is a the infection with echinococcus granulosis, which would cause hydatid disease. So we'll get into this in more detail when we talk about the pathophysiology and how this tapeworm is transmitted, but briefly, this infection is transmitted via ingestion of parasite eggs, and these parasite eggs generally come from dog feces. So this is often going to be stray dogs, or wild dogs, or even coyotes, but we can also get infected from exposure to the feces of other animals, including foxes, for instance. Now, echinococcus granulosis infections generally occur globally, although they're less common in North America and in Western Europe and more common in other parts of the world. And they're more prevalent in communities with guard dogs and herding dogs. So any places where there may be rural communities with dogs that herd other animals. So if those dogs are living outside, for instance, this is the place where we're most often going to see echinococcus infections. Now let's talk about how humans become infected. Humans are actually not the definitive host of this particular parasite. The definitive host is actually a dog or some other carnivore like a fox, as I mentioned before. These animals are going to get infected by this tapeworm through ingestion of usually internal organs of other animals. So if they have killed some animal outside and they eat some of their organ meat, they ingest the cyst, and then that cyst will then develop into an adult tapeworm inside the dog in the small intestine. And then those tapeworms inside the host will then release eggs, and those eggs will be transmitted into the external environment via the feces of that particular infected animal. And then there will be some cattle or some other animals like sheep or goats that will then feed in the grass, and they will then themselves ingest those eggs, then those eggs will then become what we call oncospheres that then attach to and penetrate the intestinal wall, circulate in the bloodstream in that animal, and then form cysts in different organs like the lungs and liver, at which time if that animal becomes killed, another dog or some other carnivore will then consume the organs of that animal and become infected and the cycle continues. Now humans can in some way be like the sheep or goats in our example, wherein they accidentally ingest an embryonated egg from some dog or some other carnivore. So the human infection starts at this stage of the cycle, so the embryonated egg in the feces, and then as mentioned, as occurs in the intermediate host, whether that is a sheep or a goat, there is a release of the oncosphere larva from that egg. There's a penetration of what we call the lamina propria. The lamina propria is going to be the layer inside the intestines. So if we look inside the intestines, there's multiple layers. So there's mucosa, and then you can see here the mucosa is made up of the epithelium, the lamina propria, and the muscularis mucosa. The oncospheres penetrate the lamina propria. They penetrate through, they enter into the blood in lymphatics, then they are carried through the blood, travel to target organs, and end up in places like the liver, which is what is going to most often occur with echinococcus granulosis. Now the thing about this particular infection is that even if a person is infected, if they have ingested those embryonated eggs, there is a oncosphere that has penetrated the small intestinal wall, entered into the bloodstream, and then been carried to the liver, and there is a cyst that has started to form in the liver, a lot of times patients may not have symptoms at all. The symptoms may not occur for patients for weeks, months, or potentially even years, so you can walk around, you wouldn't even know you have it. Now that liver, or what we would call hydatid cyst, 
can remain in the liver. It may not cause any issues, but it can slowly grow over time. Now, often it's approximated that the cyst can grow one to five centimeters per year. So it could slowly grow over time and patients wouldn't even know they had it. Now, most often the cyst is going to be singular. It's only be one cyst, but we could see in about 20 to 40% of cases, multiple cysts. And this can occur in different parts of the body as well, but we'll focus here on the liver. Now, after some time of, as that cyst increases in size, we can start to have signs and symptoms, including abdominal pain. We can have biliary obstruction. So if you look at this image here, the liver, there are intrahepatic and extrahepatic biliary ducts. The gallbladder is here, cystic duct. So what can happen is if you get cysts that become larger and larger, they can start to impinge on biliary ducts, and that can lead to biliary obstruction, which would cause a host of other issues, including jaundice. We can also see pruritus or itching sensation as bile salts begin to accumulate in the body. If the cyst grows larger and larger and starts to impact liver functioning, we can see even cirrhosis in some cases. We can often see hepatomegaly. So hepatomegaly is an enlarged liver. As that cyst gets bigger and bigger, the liver itself starts to get larger. This can ultimately feel like an abdominal mass, usually up in the right upper quadrant, so above the belly button on the patient's right. Patients will often have decreased appetite. Now, these are not the only things that can happen with these cysts. Actually, these cysts can rupture and cause anaphylaxis. So what can happen is one of these cysts, or if there are multiple, multiple could rupture. This could lead to a spilling out of tapeworms into the blood, leading to the host immune system responding. It can lead to anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis can be symptoms of hives, itching. There can be difficulty with breathing. So patients can have bronchospasm. All of these issues can occur with a ruptured cyst. Now, not every ruptured cyst can cause anaphylaxis. There could be some small cyst that ruptures, pouring out some of these small tapeworms into the blood. The infection is dealt with and we don't see an anaphylactic response. But in other cases, there may be so many that are released that there is an anaphylactic response. And that is where this can be life-threatening in some cases, especially if there's impaired breathing due to that anaphylaxis. Now that we know those signs and symptoms, and the pathophysiology, how is it diagnosed and treated by clinicians? So it's important to get a good history to see if there is a history of exposure. So this can often be an unknown or not well-recognized infection, as I mentioned before. So history of infection is going to be important if patients have been exposed to wild dogs or if they're part of any communities where there are herding dogs or if they've been exposed to coyotes or some other wild animal. If Sometimes we can see this in veterinarians and farmers. So this is going to be important with regards to having this as a potential diagnosis. So history of exposure is going to be important. Blood work can also be utilized as well. What we're going to see is that the blood work is going to often show an elevated alkaline phosphatase. So that can indicate some issues in the biliary duct system. Interestingly, though, if you were to look at ALT and AST, some of the liver enzymes that are generally elevated in liver inflammation, they're actually not always elevated in this condition. So I don't put it here because in some cases it may not be elevated. We can also see eosinophilia, so an increased level of eosinophils. Eosinophils are important in dealing with parasitic infections, so that can be an important marker to look out for. We can also do ELISA and then doing after that a confirmatory immunoblot assay to assess for these parasites. Another very important diagnostic modality is ultrasound imaging. Now, the World Health Organization has developed a classification for ultrasonography findings in echinococcosis, and they rank each of these CE1, 2, 3A, 3B, 4, and 5, depending on the ultrasound findings. And ranking this, or the classifying the ultrasonography findings, is going to be important when we talk about the treatment in the next slide. So if we were to see a unilocular fluid collection or simple cyst with a double line sign, that's CE1. Two is multivesicular, multiseptated cyst. So the cyst starts to look more complicated. It can have a honeycomb look to it. 3A is a fluid collection with a detached membrane. 3B is a presence of daughter cysts in the solid matrix. 4 is cyst with a heterogeneous hypoechoic or hyperechoic matrix without daughter cysts. And 5 is a solid cystic wall. So these can often be difficult to remember. So after doing the ultrasonography, you can look this up to see what classification that particular 
cyst falls into. And one more thing about these classifications is that classifications CE1 and CE2 indicate an active disease, whereas CE3, so anything in the three range, is considered transitional. So it's a transitional stage. And CE4 and 5 represent inactive disease. So that's something to think about here as well. Histopathology can also be performed as well. The key that I want you to remember is what we call eggshell calcification. So if you see this term on a test or on pathology with a liver abscess or liver cyst, you want to think about echinococcus granulosis. Now let's discuss how clinicians treat this condition. So sometimes there is a watch and wait approach. Sometimes the cyst is not causing any issues. Some clinicians don't want to potentially worsen Perhaps through treatment, they may cause a rupture. Sometimes it's just a watch and wait approach. They wait and see if the condition gets worse, and then they can move forward with a potential treatment. Oftentimes, in those ultrasonography stages we talked about, CE4 and CE5, those inactive stages, oftentimes that can be a wait and watch approach. And some other treatments can include benzimidazoles like albendazole or mebendazole. Either one can work. And these are going to be utilized for those ultrasonography stages of CE1 and CE3A. So that's again CE1 and CE3A. Now the reason that wait and watch approach is even mentioned is because of this point. We don't want to use benzimidazole treatments like albendazole if a cyst is prone to rupture or if patient is early stages of pregnancy. So that can often perhaps lead to a wait and watch approach or it can lead to a necessity of a surgical removal of those cysts. So we're going to use surgery or surgical removal of those cysts when they're complicated, when they're complicated cysts. So we're going to use them with stages CE2 and CE3B. Again, CE2 and CE3B. Please check out my infectious disease playlist if you want more information on other infectious diseases. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks for watching and hope to see you next time.